I'm just gonna get started. Um, hi, my name is Pete, Pete Fine. Um, this talk is titled Freeze and People. Uh, and we're talking about a bunch of different stuff today. Um, we are live on air.mozilla.org. Um, that's this IRC channel that I'm on here. Uh, also, um, if you want to use Freeze and People for Twitter, and don't worry, I'm not going to have you put this up the whole time and get horribly cold. Uh, so I uh, just want to thank folks for inviting me down here. I read a lot of talking and interviewing in different media, in television, in newspapers, radios, for the last few days, which has been unbelievably strange. But I'm more excited about this than almost anything else I've done. I think that, and particularly to be doing it here with the people who literally make the internet, who like make the web happen. Uh, and it's an honor and a pleasure to be talking here. It's also really nice to be able to just like show up in a t-shirt and not have to worry if my hair is all over the place. Like this is like I feel like you guys are my people. Like and that you know when I talk about internet culture I have been working the last nine months as what has been called an activist. And that's been a somewhat tricky term. Um, you know, the activist part I think is fairly clear, but the mainstream meaning of the word hack is just such a small slice of the pie for us, right? That in the mainstream media, hacking is breaking into websites, cracking passwords. And I think we know that, you know, when we get in a groove and we're like breaking really good code. That's hacking too. And so I like to say that for me, hacking means simply a clever technical trick, or like using a system in a way that its designer didn't intend. And so while certainly breaking into a website fits into that, there's a much larger scope of stuff that it encompasses. And I'm going to hope we can talk about some of that today. Uh, I'm an agent with a group called Telecomics, uh, which I have described in the past as an adhocracy of volunteer internauts who support free communication. Um, we also just describe ourselves as a cluster of jellyfish. Um, this is our super cool logo. Uh, it, telecomics is, amongst other things, an IRC network, uh, for individual IRC network. Uh, we're on. Uh, Mozilla's IRC, Telecomics has its own. Um, we don't have any formal members. We don't have any leaders. There's no hierarchy. There's no policy committee. People just show up on Telecomics' IRC and have an idea or something they want to work on, and they find some collaborators, and they go do it. And so this model is very similar, I think, to the way that a lot of open source projects work. You get contributors who volunteer, and they show up maybe for a week or a patch, or some of them become longer term. And so we're doing something something similar. The important thing I want to point out, though, is telecomics is not just programmers. It's not just people writing code and network admins. There's a much, much broader range of participants. And while I'm mostly going to talk about tech stuff, there are politicians, there are university professors, there are graduate students in rhetoric, uh, philosophers, pirates, really, really interesting mix, mix of folks. And we seem to be drawn together by a desire to have an internet adventure. That, yeah, to see what we can make of the internet and what free communication and a free and open internet can enable in our lives and lives of other people that we work with. I should point out that telecomics is currently down for a reboot. We somehow wound up being tech support for the Arab Spring. Uh, one of our guys recently said in a newspaper interview that there's basically 10 people providing technical support for Syria right now. And that's some dudes on our IRC. We didn't intend to start out like that. Um, I've been involved for about the last nine months or so. The guys who started it originally thought of it as a think tank 
or a policy consultant, you know, that they would build some tools for cryptography, stuff like that. But we somehow stumbled into trying to keep the internet running in the Middle East. And I think we're really tired from that. And I think we want to take some time off and just reflect on what we've done and where, where we want to go forward. So yeah, you're certainly welcome to join us. It's telcomics.org uh, with an X. Um, you'll see a little message there about uh, why we're shut down. My personal thoughts on this, I keep a blog at blog.wearpants.org. And under the telecomics tag, I've written some stuff most recently about, about our shutdown. Like I said, most of what telecomics has done has been prominently in the last nine months of keeping the internet running face of a variety of forms of government censorship. We were extremely active during the Egyptian revolution of trying to keep the internet up. And so I'd like to talk a little bit about what happened there. Uh, I'm, I'm guessing most of the people in this room are pretty familiar with the censorship and complete shutting down of the internet in Egypt. Um, from our perspective, or at least my perspective, and I should point out here that I'm really only speaking for myself. The group doesn't have official spokespersons. I can only speak from my experiences and kind of to try to explain what I think we're about and what, what's going on. Um, in Egypt, I think there were like two phases of, of censorship. There was kind of the first half, which was sort of a selective filtering, uh, where people couldn't reach Twitter, they couldn't reach Facebook. Um, Egyptian-oriented uh, forum and video sites were unreachable, but the rest of the web was largely largely available. And so there were we did a whole bunch of different stuff, but in that in that phase, the main sort of things we were doing were providing people with proxies to Tor and VPNs and kind of other types of encrypted tunnels through through the net to allow them to reach some of these sites and to do so in a way that was anonymous and difficult to wiretap. We also would set up mirrors of censored sites where we get people who had some content that had been blocked and copy that over onto other hosts. Uh, finally, the, the last thing we did that seemed to work really well is we served as this manual relay uh, from IRC to Twitter. So we would have people come on to our IRC who were unable to access Twitter on their own, and we would take reports from them and use Twitter pass those on to the world. So this is the kind of facilitation of communication that we were doing and I think I think we are about. The second phase of Egypt was kind of nuts. Because the Egyptian government like literally not electronically, but pulled the only fiber optic cable out of the wall. Most of a lot of these countries there's a single data center with a single or maybe two fiber optic cables that provides internet access to the entire country. The peering between individual ISPs within the country is often actually done back up in Europe. Right? They, don't, they don't actually peer with each other. And so there's this central point where government can come in and go to the communications ministry and say, turn those machines off. Just turn them off. And they have to do it. And so that is more or less what we saw in Egypt. Uh, they also shut down. Cell and SMS service. The only thing that continued to work was landline phones. And so the reaction was kind of just like, what the fuck? Like, what the fuck do we do now? Um, you know, this the to completely turn off communications in such a, a broad, broad-based manner. The things that ooh, I'm speaking of communications, I think I just lost a VPN. Uh, so and we might lose. This IRC down on the bottom here. The stuff we did included we put together, working with French ISPs and individual users, a pool of about 500 dial up modem lines so that people could dial in to access the internet. So those were in the US and Europe, um, largely unlogged. Uh, one guy, forgot to turn the logs off on one of his box and found people downloading movies. It's kind of funny over a dial-up line in the middle of a revolution. But, you know, I guess they need, need a break as well. Um, 
those were those were fantastically. We tried to run those again for Lydia, and they got blocked within two days by the state telco. We tried to run them for Syria, and the Syrians won't use them because their phones are all packed. We also sent fax blasts, basically with Google up, using the Google cache, and find the phone numbers of fax machines in Egypt, at universities and coffee shops and stuff like that, and send faxes containing uh, comms and medical information, like treatments for tear gas, basically everything we can find. We also set up what I call reverse fax service, so that people could fax news out of the country. And that's somewhat less secure, and we kind of publicized that, but it did seem to work as well. When you're doing this kind of work, you throw a lot up against the wall, and some of it sticks. Some of it doesn't. And one of the things we threw against the wall was amateur radio, ham radio. Uh, that project did not actually, we didn't actually make communication with anybody on the ground. There were only about 130 ham radio operators to begin with, most of them were likely ex-military. But despite that, I still consider that project a success. Uh, we forged some really good collaborations between Eternauts and Hams. Um, people were talking about, hey, let's write a ham radio to Twitter gateway. Let's write a ham radio to email gateway, just for translating Morse code directly onto the net. It also caused a a bit of a shakeup and a bit of a conversation inside the ham radio community itself, which is certainly some young dudes with some older guys, and they're they're concerned about political access. And, uh, yeah. Um, the other thing we did was use Nmap. I, I didn't work on this project. I think it's the coolest thing I've ever heard. These guys Nmap the entire Egyptian IP address space in about 36 hours. And there were so few machines up, right? I mean, normally that would take like six weeks or so, right, to actually scan all those machines. But there were so few machines that were up, only about 6,000, but it took a relatively short amount of time. And they used that information to find some web servers and then injected human-readable messages into the web server logs. So they did, a get, they did something like get, we are telecomics, we are from the internet, we are here to help. Call us at you know this phone number. You know, stay safe. Uh, again, something it's really hard sometimes to tell tell if these things work. You know that per se, yes, this message has been received. We know people use use the dial numbers. We know that that worked. But yeah, I mean, and so, so sometimes you don't know and you throw a lot. And just the opportunities, I, it's hard to explain just how kind of cool this is. Like, just as a as a, a, a techie, like, we, like, busted out some modems and fax machines and Nmap and stuff to try to keep communication going. Like, I think those modems were a pretty epic hack. I think the modems were a pretty, pretty epic hack. I think using Nmap and web server logging in this way is a pretty epic hack. This isn't breaking into websites, right? But that's, that's a pretty clever trick. You know, eventually, Egypt, they turned the internet back on. Um, we continued to sort of provide assistance, but we eventually moved on. We eventually moved on, so did the rest of the world. And I think the situation there is not done. You know, they still haven't had elections, they still haven't written a constitution. The ruling military council kicked some protesters out of Tahrir. It's, it's difficult, you know. They have had dictatorship for 50 years as a culture, and just are not, as a culture, not that they're not capable of it, but just are not in the practice of democratic habits. And so I think what happens in Egypt going forward is an open question. And while I would love to be helping there, I have moved on to other things.